Hey you guys, Flickers of Fear time, and we're continuing on with Giallo July. This is the penultimate <laughs> installment of Giallo July. And today we're going to be talking about Umberto Lenzi. Now, uh, Umberto Lenzi, if you're a fan of Italian horror, um, Italian gore films in particular, then that name should be very familiar to you. He was uh, the man responsible for such infamous cannibal flicks as Man from Deep River, which I think was actually the first Italian cannibal flick, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he also made Eaten Alive and Cannibal Ferox, one of the, the video nasties. But he also directed a number of Giallo films, uh, including Eyeball, uh, So Sweet, So Perverse, Seven Bloodstained Orchids, which I've seen and is actually very good, and the film we're discussing today, which is called Knife of Ice. Now, in spite of Lindsay's uh, pedigree, vis-a-vis <laughs> -vis his cannibal cycle, I guess if you want to call it that, and also in spite of the fact that Knife of Ice stars Carol Baker, who was actually in three of Lindsay's previous Giallo movies, which were just stuffed to the gills with sex and violence, this one is actually surprisingly restrained. And though I liked it quite a bit, um, if you're looking for buckets of blood and big, beautiful, heaving, bouncing boobies, then you had better look elsewhere because you will be sorely, sorely disappointed. This one is just very, very, very conservative. So Knife of Ice actually took its inspiration from the 1946 horror movie, The Spiral Staircase. Uh, Lindsay was initially going to do a remake of that, uh, starring Carol Baker. But in the end, I don't know if he couldn't get the rights or if he just decided, hey, I'm just going to do like my own original story, which is just kind of like take some ideas from that. The main idea being that the main character is going to be a mute woman who's stalked by a killer. The title of the film, incidentally, is taken from a quote which is attributed to Edgar Allan Poe. Not sure if it was actually a quote from him or not, but the quote is, fear is a knife of ice which penetrates the senses down to the depth of conscience. And though the murderer does use a knife, and uh, presumably there's some fear generated thereby, uh, at no point does anyone use a knife that's actually made of ice. So, you know, just trying to manage expectations. Uh, again, incidentally, this film also gets compared quite often to Lucio Fulci's Don't Torture a Duckling, which also came out in 1972, same as this movie. Now, please note, those of you who are sensitive to animal violence, uh, such as me, I wish somebody had told me this ahead of time, but, but nobody did. I had to find out the hard way. Uh, please note that the very first shots of the film, the very opening sequence, like with the credits and everything like that, are of an actual bullfight uh, in which the bull gets killed. So again, if you're very sensitive to real animal cruelty, uh, you might want to skip ahead till after the credits. Uh, but there are some scenes uh, of this bullfight that turn up in flashback, like briefly later on in the movie. Uh, so fair warning. Also, and this is, man, this is like something that I complain about a lot. There is also a sweet kitty cat that occurs, that appears like early on in the film. So you know how that's going to go. Uh, yeah, that death isn't real, I hope. Uh, but it's still upsetting because you know how I am about kitties. Leave the damn animals alone, Italy. God damn it. Well, actually now it's just kind of like every time you see a cat or a dog in a horror movie, I'm just like, well, they're done for. <laughs> I don't know if I want to watch this or not. Because it's always become like this edgy thing. Like, I don't know. I guess because we're all so, uh, horror fans are just so inured to seeing people getting killed. So it's like, we're going to kill Fido. That's like, everyone's going to be mad about that. So I was just like, knock it off. They didn't, they didn't deserve it. Just kill the people. I don't care. So Carol Baker plays Martha. And she's a young woman who's actually been completely mute since she saw her parents die in a horrible, fiery train wreck when she was just a little girl. I guess like her dad like chucked her out the train window, which is actually kind of comical but sort of like horrific at the same time so she like escaped the flames but her parents did not so they were in there and they burned to death and she saw the whole thing happening so she hasn't talked since then now she does seem to be managing all right though uh she lives with her uncle ralph and a couple of servants at this very pleasant estate uh, up in the spanish pyrenees and she also has a kindly family physician named Dr. Laurent, who seems to be taking care of her. Now, her uncle Ralph has a heart condition, and so he needs to be, like, he's okay, he's still pretty spry, like, he walks around and stuff, he's a scholar of some kind, and, but he has to kind of be, like, have bed rest sometimes, and he's on all this medication, which, you know, Martha seems to be more than capable of, like, taking care of him, and everybody just seems to think Martha is the bee's knees, like, she's just the best 
best, kindest, loveliest uh, person ever. Now, at the beginning of the movie, Martha's sister, Jenny, uh, arrives for a visit. Now, Jenny is apparently kind of like a famous singer. I don't really know what kind of singer she is. It was like opera or it wasn't opera exactly. I'm not really sure what it was, but she's like kind of a famous singer and she's been touring North America and she's talking about how, you know, successful the tour has been. So she arrives by train and Martha is very, very proud of herself for being able to meet her sister at the train station, which obviously uh, she had traumas about going to a train station because of the shit that happened to her parents. Uh, So she had never been able to go to a train station before. So she's like super excited she's making some progress you know she actually went to the train station to pick her sister up now jenny comes there uh bearing gifts she actually has a pile of books on the occult which she's going to give to uncle ralph who studies that kind of thing which again it's one of the things that's supposed to make him seem suspicious because this this is a giallo movie so everybody has to have like red herring stuff everybody has to seem sketchy so that's his sketchy thing uh and she also brings this old audio recording like a reel-to-reel tape type situation that's like a recording of martha as a child reciting the lewis carroll poem the mouse's tale and this was obviously before the accident uh where you know martha lost her voice where she couldn't talk anymore now while the two women are being driven back to the house a very strange incident occurs whereby this dude with these bizarre kind of cloudy speckly something like looking eyes kind of comes out of the fog. This is a very foggy movie, by the way. Um, So just know that going in. Like, not all of it, but a lot of it's, like, really foggy. So he comes out of the fog and, like, looks at them through the car window and then disappears again. Uh, It's weird because I think this is maybe, like, the third or fourth Giallo movie I've watched recently that had, like, somebody wearing weird contact lenses, like, as a plot point. So I'm guessing that maybe these weird contact lenses like because remember i was talking about the ones that were like people with bright blue contact lenses and shit like that like the last couple i talked about um this must have been like a new thing like these weird looking contact lenses like that were easy to wear so i'm guessing that's why they inserted them in like so many movies because it's like oh it's this new cool thing but yeah they're in this one too so that must have been like a big trend in italy in the early 1970s Now, the night that Jenny arrives at the house, the household hosts a birthday party for uh, the 13-year-old. I guess she's like a neighbor girl or I don't remember if she's like an orphan or something like that. But her name's Christina, and she's actually like a close friend of Martha's. I don't know if Martha, is Martha like maybe tutoring her? I don't remember. I said something like that. They just say it's almost kind of like, you know, like a mother-daughter situation. So I'm guessing like the little girl doesn't have parents. I don't know. So I think they mentioned it, but I can't remember. Now at the party, we are introduced to most of our main characters, uh, you know, or suspects if you prefer, because that's essentially what they are, uh, including the aforementioned Dr. Laurent. There's a local priest named Father Martin, uh, this very shifty ass chauffeur named Marcos, and the two housekeepers, uh, one of whom is named Annie and one of whom is named Rosalie. Now, later that night, after all the guests have presumably gone home, Jenny wakes up because she hears something breaking downstairs. So she creeps down there to investigate and finds the door to the garage, like from the house to the garage, like wide open. Now, unwisely, because she should know that she's in a Giallo movie, and this is never a good thing to do if you're in a Giallo movie, she goes into the garage to check it out because she hears like a noise in there and she's like, why is this door open? And uh, it will surprise no one to know that she ends up on the wrong end of a knife. Now, when her body is found underneath the car the next morning, the cops are naturally uh, summoned to deal with it, and everybody in the household is questioned. The two guys that the movie leans hardest into making you suspect immediately are Marcos, who frankly always acts super sus, <laughs> like just whatever. He always he looks a little bit like Boris Karloff, so I think that it's like, because I was like, the first time I saw him, I was like, man, look at that Boris Karloff looking motherfucker. <laughs> but yeah, he does actually look a lot like Boris Karloff. He kind of acts like him, so he's very, very shifty. Uh, and Dr. Laurent, Now, his thing was he claims that he left the party. Then he's like, oh, I got a couple minutes away. Remembered I left my medical bag behind and I came back to the house to get it. But because the house was all locked up and all the lights were out, um, I didn't want to disturb anybody, like wake him up by knocking to get my bag back. So I left again. Not so fast, says Marcos, the shifty Boris Karloff looking motherfucker. He tells police that Dr. Laurent Uh, that he saw Dr. Laurent standing by his car in the driveway and that he was signaling up to Annie, one of the housekeepers, who was leaning out her bedroom window. So he says there was a light on in the house. It was Annie's. And he's like, so that was a lie that you came back and nobody was awake. He's like, I saw you signaling. Now, both Dr. Laurent and Annie deny that this happened, but 
you know, I, this is put in here so that the viewer is clearly supposed to find Dr. Laurent's movements, like, sketchy, as the fact that he went back to the house to fetch his bag placed him uh, at the scene of Jenny's murder at the approximate time that it happened, like, between 11.30 and midnight or whatever it was. His medical bag, though, it should be noted, uh, was actually still by the front door, just like he said it would be. He's like, yeah, I think I left it by the front door because I was, like, walking out and I left it there. So the police do find it there. So he's like, okay, well, that checks out. Now, at the end of the interrogation, after they've, you know, brought up, like, suspicions about several of the people, the detectives actually kind of surprise everybody by saying, well, actually, we think that this murder was committed by this random sex maniac uh, because another woman with blonde hair was actually found dead in a ditch not too far from this house. This woman is, I don't think she's ever named. Now, at Jenny's funeral, Martha sees the guy with the weird contact lenses peering at her, like, through the bushes. And she, you know, says to the other, well, she doesn't say because she can't talk, but, you know, she gestures to the other. She's like, hey, that guy's over there. Uh, so all the other people at the at the funeral, like the doctor and everything like that, they run after the guy. Now, the guy escapes, but he's dropped like a pendant that has uh, a goat's head on it. So this leads investigators to think, obviously, that the murderer is a Satanist. So they're like, okay, well, they theorize that the killer maybe uh, is targeting young blonde women because Jenny was also young and blonde, uh, you know, for sacrifice. So they advise Martha, who is also blonde, uh, that she should be probably on the lookout to ensure that she is not the next victim. The next one on the chopping block, though, isn't Martha, but is actually the dark-haired housekeeper, Annie, who one day goes into town on her bicycle to do some shopping, spots a goat's head symbol, like painted in red on a tree trunk. She goes unwisely again to investigate and gets murdered, like gets her throat slashed. Shortly after this, Dr. Laurent arrives at Martha's house and has a bit of blood or perhaps red paint on his pants. Now he explains this away as like, oh, that was one of my patients. Like he had some shit happening. Like he sprayed a little bit of blood on me. I didn't notice. Because the movie is trying so hard to make you think Dr. Laurent is the killer, you just know by laws of giallo logic that it's absolutely not him. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. I'm just like, tone it, to just dial it back a little bit because like that's obviously not who it is. It's never the most obvious person, never. Even though it should be said that he does also conveniently forget something else after the little girl, Christina, uh, actually becomes the final casualty of the slasher. Now, at some point, the Satanist guy with the, with the weird contact lenses is also apprehended. And it turns out that he's just like a, this morphine addicted British hippie who is absolutely a Satanist, but he mostly just likes, he's not sacrificing anybody. He just basically likes to do black masses and abandoned buildings and stuff like, you know, well, don't we all, don't we all, sure. <laughs> no, but uh, but yeah. So the whole angle about like the satanic serial killer and the unnamed woman who was found in the ditch, uh, even though a lot of screen time is devoted to it, actually just kind of serves as the film's biggest red herring. Matter of fact, uh, this film in particular, though it did manage to throw me off effectively a few times like later on, telegraphs who the murderer is fairly early on, at least if you're paying attention. So even though I was slightly surprised by, I think like the way it was revealed because they did a couple things I didn't expect, I have to say I wasn't all that shocked by the big twist at the end. And uh, like I said, I think if you're paying attention, you probably won't be either. I don't know, it's like hard for me to say. Uh, that said, I still did have a pretty good time with this one, even though I think like the final revelation wasn't quite the bombshell that it was apparently meant to be, because I kind of saw it coming. But there were some things that I didn't see coming, so you know. So as I mentioned, this is a pretty serviceable uh, Giallo movie. All the standard murder mystery tropes, uh, you know, you got your rogues gallery of possible suspects. There's some fun twists and turns in there. There is absolutely no sex or nudity, uh, and it's not gory in the slightest other than the bullfighting stuff. Uh, all the murders essentially occur off screen. You don't really see a lot of it happen. Um, you know, sometimes you see the aftermath, but it's not even bloody. I don't even remember hardly any blood in it at all, or even any of the kind of like operatic or super violent like stabbing. There's nothing like that. It's basically just kind of like, hey, here's a knife, here's the woman's face, she's screaming, and then you cut to the next scene. So there's hardly any blood in it at all. But it was still like entertaining enough to hold my attention, though I will admit that it seemed a little bit buttoned up in place. I guess, like I said, it's a very conservative giallo in the sense that, you know, it's just very much a parlor murder mystery type thing with no 
there's no sleaze element to it. It's not sleazy in the slightest. Now, Carol Baker, I have to say, was great as Martha. Um, she was able to convey a lot of emotion, like, just with her face, as obviously she doesn't say a single word uh, throughout the entire film. So that was great. Uh, you know, like I said, the resolution of the mystery is pretty obvious from the get-go. But, I mean, all the little byways that the movie went down to try to lead you away from who the killer actually was were pretty enjoyable diversions, so I'm not going to complain too much. In terms of Giallo movies, um, it was, you know, nothing to write home about. But it's still a decent watch if you're more into the more, you know, murder mystery angle and not so much the sex and violence angle, because like I said, this one really doesn't have either of those two things. So that will do it for this installment of Giallo July on Flickers of Fear. We're going to do one more before the end of the month, so hopefully you'll tune in for that one. And that'll do it for today. I will see you guys on the next one. Bye. <laughs>